out uh, this evening. Um, we'll get started. Uh, first of all, my name is uh, Mr. Miller, athletic director with the uh, high school and middle school. And if you picked up an agenda, uh, you can follow that. And the first uh, presenter uh, tonight will be Ed Vopel from uh, Habish, Habish, and Rotier. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. I appreciate the time. Um, I've been allotted 10 minutes, so I'll try not to take any more than that. Um, two things. Uh, this is not, number one, this is not going to be a lecture. Number two, it's not going to be legal advice. Hopefully this will just be informative to you and uh, thought-provoking so that when you're making decisions over the next course of your years at the high school, that you make good decisions. Uh, my topic tonight is going to be just a general overview of the legal consequences of underage drinking. And I've got a couple of slides that I'd like to go through with you as we discuss this topic. There was a study done in 2012 uh, from the Wisconsin Epidemiological Profile of Alcohol and Other Drug Use in Wisconsin. I wanted to frame this issue primarily so that you understand how significant the use of alcohol is in Wisconsin in our daily lives. I don't mean to bore you with statistics, but I do want you to focus on the importance of alcohol in Wisconsin. In 2010, alcohol uses and misuses caused 1,732 deaths, 3,511 injuries, and 67,345 arrests. In Wisconsin, we have 1.5 one time, times the national rate for operating motor vehicle while intoxicated. We have three times the national rate for arrests for other liquor law violations. In 2010, statistically, there were 254 deaths in Wisconsin motor vehicle accidents. 44% of all fatalities in motor vehicle, motor vehicle accidents were alcohol related in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, unfortunately, has the highest rate of drinking and driving in the nation at 24%. In 2011, Wisconsin high school youth had the eighth highest percentage of current alcohol use, which means approximately at least one drink within the last 30 days. 39% of high school students in 2011 reported alcohol use. 24% of those of high school students reported binge drinking, which means having more than five drinks in any one city. The good news about those statistics on a national basis in Wisconsin is that youth drinking, and specifically high school drinking, is improving. So those numbers are going down throughout the course of the years. But you can see that it's still a very significant problem and something that we have to be aware of. All right, so as a high school student and parent of a high school student in Wisconsin, what types of laws govern your conduct? Laws primarily come from three sources in Wisconsin. Number one, the laws come from the Wisconsin statutes. The Wisconsin statutes in several volume edition it has 992 chapters, although each one of those chapters is not assigned a particular topic of the law. And the Wisconsin statutes cover just everything that you could possibly think of, from property to individual rights to penalties to all types of things. So first of all, the Wisconsin statute contains laws pertaining to alcohol, including the penalties to minors for possession and consumption of alcohol, and the criminal penalties to adults who furnish alcohol to minors. Secondly, municipal ordinances exist in the in their villages, in their communities. Muni the municipalities can adopt the state statutes, which means that they can mirror the state statutes. They can't do less than the state statutes, but muni munis municipalities are allowed to charge somebody with a municipal ordinance violation. If that happens, what that means is that you would typically go down to your village hall or city hall and you'd be prosecuted by a village or city attorney or things like that. And then finally, case law in Wisconsin consists of appellate and Supreme Court decisions interpreting the statutes, the Wisconsin statutes. All right, possession and or consumption of alcohol by minors is covered by Wisconsin statute 125.07 paren 4 paren. It is illegal for any underage person under 21 years, not accompanied by his or her parent, guardian, or spouse, who has attained the legal drinking age to knowingly possess or consume alcoholic beverages. It is illegal for an underage person to procure, obtain, acquire, or attempt to procure alcoholic beverages. Pretty simple stuff. It is illegal for a person to falsely represent his or her age for the purposes of receiving alcoholic beverages. For a first violation of this law, if you are a minor and you violate this the first time, there's a fine between $100 and $500, a suspension depending on what happens of your person's operating or driving privileges. 
participation in supervised work program, or community service work, or any combination of all of those above penalties. For a second violation, the fine goes up to 200 and 500 with all the remaining uh, provisions of the first violation. For a third violation, the penalty goes up the fine and forfeiture 300 to 750, and for a fourth violation, 500 to 1,000. There are also laws governing giving alcohol or providing alcohol to minors, which includes parents, friends, other types of adults. No person may procure or sell, dispense, or give away any alcoholic beverages to any underage person not accompanied by his or her parent, guardian, spouse who has attained the legal drinking age. No adult may knowingly permit or fail to take action to prevent the illegal consumption of alcoholic beverages by an underage person on premises owned by the adult or under the adult's control. And it has an exception for religious services. No adult may intentionally encourage or contribute to an underage person's violation of this law. All right, there are fines associated with an adult's person violation of those law. There can be imprisonment if there is an additional violation in a certain amount of time. You, I'll just briefly go through those fines about more than 500 if no previous violation within 30 months. You can see if there's a previous violation within 30 months. The fines double, and there can be imprisonment attached to that. So a violation of that law can be very serious. Providing alcoholic beverages to a minor. Any person who procures alcohol beverage for or sells, dispenses, or gives away alcoholic beverages to a person under 18 may be penalized if the person knew that the person was under 18 or if the underage person dies or suffers great bodily harm as a result of consuming the alcoholic beverages. And there's a variety of different things. Uh, there are statutory definitions, there are legal definitions of what a person knew or should have known that a person was underage. I won't go through all that with you. It's, um, it, it's technical, but it's, there are a lot of common sense provisions included in that. Uh, great bodily harm means essentially what it says, which causes serious permanent disfigurement, which causes a permanent or protracted loss or impairment in the function of any bodily uh, member or organ or other serious bodily harm. All right, penalties for violation of the law. If an adult provides alcohol to a minor and violates this law and causes great bodily harm, if the minor suffers great bodily harm, the person who provided the alcohol can be charged with a Class H felony, which includes, upon conviction, a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment of not more than six years or more. If, an, unfortunately, a death would result, uh, the person who provided alcohol may be charged with a Class G felony, which is a fine of not more than $25,000 and imprisonment for not more than 10 years. So as you can see, it's a very serious offense. It's something to take very seriously. Uh, if your parent and a homeowner or other kids come over, to just to keep in mind uh, that there are these penalties and provisions out there. Obviously, again, common sense. Don't drink alcohol if you're under age 21. And I wanted to thank you for allowing me this very brief opportunity to go through these provisions with you. Hopefully you all know them, understand them, and appreciate them. And it will allow you to make good decisions uh, during your high school years, and especially as athletes, uh, it's equally important. So, what's that? Anybody have any questions? Any questions? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, to kind of piggyback on that, um, I'm going to go over a few of the rules of the co-curricular code that was implemented last year. Um, and to our credit, our student body here did a phenomenal job. We had very few uh, infractions throughout the school year. Our students are doing a great job. But I just wanted to make you aware, so first of all, I want to congratulate the student body on making the right choices and for you parents supporting your students and making those right choices. Uh, but a few things that since I've been here, it comes up every year, and I just want to clarify one of them, the academic suspension probation. When you get a letter, if your son or daughter, we do this academic suspension letter every, the 15th day of the term, the 30th day of the term, and when the term ends. And typically Mrs. Gorrell's very good at running this. On that 15th day at 8.30 in the morning, she runs it. And so at that moment in time, if your son or daughter meets the criteria of probation or suspension, it automatically generates a letter. The most common phone call I get from parents is, I looked at power school and they're passing. They got all A's, how are they getting? I'm just letting you know, at that moment in time, when we ran the report, your son or daughter met the criteria. Maybe 
Later on at 9 o'clock, the teacher entered grades and now they're back up to passing or whatever else. And so, but at that moment in time, that sets the criteria for, for academic suspension or probation. Probation is simply a warning play. It's just telling you that at that moment in time, your son or daughter met the criteria. They're still allowed to participate fully in all activities. It just means at that moment in time when we ran it, it met the criteria of probation. Suspension means that they are now suspended until the next time we run the report. So that's, that's basically what academic suspension is. So when you get the letter, the first thing you do is look to see if it's suspension or probation. And if it's suspension, then you can start talking to your son or daughter about how did you end up on suspension. And then if you need to, contact their, their teachers to find out what happened. Okay? Second thing, uh, this was uh, in the co-curricular code last year that was added. Uh, attendance on game day or day of events. The student must be in school for the full day. I know there's some confusion where parents would say, well, I, I, I'm excusing my son or daughter this morning because they were tired and uh, they come to school around uh, just about before the end of first block or halfway through first block. That is unacceptable. They will not be allowed to participate in the game that evening. So just so that you're aware of that, they need to be in school the full day. So just to clear up any confusion on that, they have to be in school the full day. If they decide to go home fourth block because they were feeling a little sick, um, they are not still, that's still not constituting a full day. Full day means block one, two, three, and four. Okay? Now, if you go to the doctor, um, if you have college visits, that, that's all part of the normal excuse type things. So that's, that's different. Driving tests, Army test, whatever, but um, they have to be in school for the full day of the day of the event. Did I answer your question, Marcus? No. What happens if you walk in late, like 10 minutes late? And just 10 minutes, you're still considered late. Once you get beyond 20 minutes late for the day, like 8.25, then that constitutes, then we constitute that as almost being, basically being absent. Okay. So if you come in like 8.05, 8.10, because you're being tardy, you're still okay. <laughs> Um, third thing I want to touch on, and, and we didn't really have any issues with this last year, um, but just to remind you about the mere presence policy, that if your son or daughter is at an underage drinking party, and merely being at that party violates the code. So they fall under the violation of the code at that point. So I'm just explaining that again. I also had some confusion with people saying, well, that it means they can't work at Pizza Hut or they can't work. No, they can still work at all those places. That's all legal things. Going to a graduation party, wedding, still legal. It's just that if the graduation party they're attending is at midnight out in the middle of the cornfield someplace, <laughs> that's probably not acceptable. Okay? But if it happens to be the family gathering, which is a normal event, and there's alcohol being consumed there, but they're with, that's fine. Because that's a normal um, festival, festivity type thing. Just that it turns to be 2 o'clock in the morning and we're in a different location than we uh, the last thing, just to let you know, Mr. Miller and I do not, and I'll say this again because people accuse us of doing this all day long, do not jump on Facebook, do not jump on social media, and are not looking for pictures. We don't have time for that. It's amazing the amount of people that can criticize us for the fact that you must be searching. We are not searching for it. It shows up on my desk as a picture of a person underage, as a student of ours, holding a can of beer, I have to, and Mr. Miller has to follow up and, and, and investigate. That's how these things show up. That's how the thing starts. So I want to clear that up right now. And for you parents, I highly encourage you, if your son or daughter has a Facebook page, look at it. Make them show you. You'll be shocked. If you've never looked at your kid's Facebook page or look at their friend's Facebook pages at the pictures that are out there. And I'm, just, I'm getting a little on my soapbox here because it has that big of importance to your son or daughter when they graduate here and try to go to college, try to get a job. People are looking at those things. I know of several athletes, not from our school, other schools that lost a scholarship because the coach went and checked their Facebook page and they're there drinking. And they're actively showing this picture. They're proud of it. They lost a full scholarship because of it. 
Colleges do not want to invest that kind of money and time and effort in somebody that doesn't value them. Like they can't do those types of, you know, they, they, they just show that. And it's like, well, that, that, that he's doing it now in high school, what's he going to do in college? He or she. So, just to stress again, Bill and I do not go and look for this stuff. It shows up at our desk, and as all things, we have to investigate them. And that's how the ball starts rolling. Secondly, I'd encourage you as parents to definitely go look at those Facebook pages and, and have your son or daughter tonight show them to you. Look at those pictures. Make them clean them up. Because it has longer lasting impacts on the road. This is something different than you and I ever experienced when we were growing up. So that's just my little soapbox. I'll step down now. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Miller. If you have any questions later, you can, you can address me. I'll be here all evening. Hey, thank you, Mr. Nails. And uh, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I don't know the first thing about going to a Facebook page. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to get into the, uh, well, before we do that, um, Barb is going to be printing off some more high school packets. I know we ran out on the table. Um, so if you need to get a high school packet, uh, be sure you get that. The high school one and the middle school one are different. I mean, some of the pages are similar, but the uh, high school packet is a little bit thicker. An extra form in that one. Um, all right, it's hard to believe that we're back already starting the new school year. Um, seems like we just got out. Um, didn't have a spring, so it uh, really ran quickly here. But uh, to get into the uh, uh, the packet here, I'm going to use the uh, school website. Uh, I assume that everybody's familiar with this uh, this page. Go to any of the. Uh, school websites, high school, middle school, elementary, you, you'll come up for this uh, page. From this page, um, we go to, uh, I'm just going to use the high school one. Now, as I go through this, a lot of the high, high school and middle school uh, things will be similar. If you, you can also go to the middle school uh, right here and get all the information by just going to this one right here. Okay, but it's going to go to the high school first. Uh, if you go down to athletics, you're on the left hand side. And the first thing it'll show is the uh, directions to all of our uh, sites that we use for athletics. I'm assuming that's pretty more so for uh, the visiting schools, but uh, it's on there. All right, then if you go over to the left-hand side here, uh, we got different, oops, I don't like that. Okay. All right, this, uh, the video is from last year's. All right, obviously we'll have a new video up there. It should be running uh, sometime tomorrow. Okay, and then right here, um, right in this area, it uh, explains, um, what this page is all about. So, um, if you read along there, mandatory meeting today uh, will be accepted, or the forms will be uh, accepted in the high school office prior to a student being declared eligible to practice and compete in athletics. Uh, something we're doing differently this year is all the forms must be in Friday prior to the first day of practice. So, in other words, uh, football, I believe, starts August 6th. All right, that's the uh, Monday. Uh, you must have all your forms and fees in on that Friday prior. Volleyball starts on the uh, uh, 19th, so all forms must be in on the 16th, 16th of August on that Friday. If you bring it in on that Monday, the office will accept them, but you will not be eligible to practice until Tuesday. Okay, the next day. They do need time to uh, process uh, the forms, uh, especially if you're bringing any um, uh, physical form. And uh, you, know, you tell the person at the office that you don't need a physical, all you need is a permission form turned in. They need time to look back at your records uh, to see when your last physical was. Okay, we don't want to have a athlete out on the field uh, participating in something and only find out that uh, they did not take their physical yet for this year. Okay, so uh, just be aware of that. It must be turned in, everything in, uh, Friday before. All right. Um, uh, staple of 
lot of you picked up the packets here, which are already stapled together. Uh, you, the high school, uh, there's three pages, four forms, one is there's back to back on one page. Uh, so the first three pages for the high school, those should be turned in. You can take off or tear off the back pages. It's information on concussions and so forth that I delay eligibility information. Uh, middle school, you'll have you have a three-page packet, and you should turn in the top two pages okay, to the office. Um, if you go online, print it off, just staple together the forms that are needed. Uh, include the $15 participation fee for the student's first sport of the, for the school year. If the student is participating in football, volleyball, basketball, or wrestling, include a $10 laundry fee, uh, this is for high school, in addition to the $15 fee. Um, if the student is going out for more than one season of athletics, the $15 participation fee, $10 when applicable, should be brought to the office one week before the start of the season's first practice date, along with another signed parent and athlete concussion form. If you want to bring it in sooner, that's fine. Uh, many of the uh, program, sports programs, for example, uh, basketball, will probably have a meeting uh, sometime in October. Right, and the coach should, should have these uh, packets at that time, too, for the additional uh, uh, parent and concussion agreement forms. Right, so anytime after that, you can turn in the uh, packets and fees. And I'll, I'll talk about the concussion agreement form in a second. Uh, if you need to take, this is high school only now, if you need to take a concussion test yet, um, you need to call the high school office at the number listed and make an appointment. Uh, we did try to catch all the incoming freshmen, juniors, and first-time athletes uh, this past May. We made announcements for all those uh, students. Uh, hopefully they took care of that. Uh, but if you haven't, um, and you're a freshman, junior, or first-time athlete, you need to make the appointment. Um, physical dates are listed right there. They begin tomorrow. Uh, you can call that uh, number to make an appointment. Uh, the $25 comes back to the school, or we're big here, generous enough to uh, donate that back to our athletic department. We use that uh, towards our uh, concussion testing fee the service that we use, and also for the uh, senior athletic banquet. Uh, we can see the receiver here. So, um, these first three right here, just some information to read on your, on your own. Forms, the four different forms. This first one right here is on the high school packet. Middle school packet wouldn't have it. It again uh, gives you information on uh, what we're doing here as far as when it needs to be turned in. And you'll sign down at the bottom right here. Student's name. Um, obviously those here tonight would be uh, checking off that you attended the meeting. Uh, those that are watching that video will check the uh, second box and then you turn this in. Right, the second form, this one is in both the uh, high school and middle school packet. Uh, some of those that, uh, the, top, the top portion is permission for the uh, parents to sign, letting uh, saying that you're permitting your son or daughter to participate in athletics. The bottom section of that page is the physical exam. Okay, physical exam is taken April 1st and thereafter is valid for the following two years. All right, uh, some of you may recall these used to be a green uh, form. Okay, we just use a one sheet of paper now instead of that green form. Uh, if you do need a physical, have your physician uh, fill out this area. Some of them will have a have their own form that they fill out. That's fine. Just attach it to this right here. Okay, attach it to this page down at the bottom. Uh, staple it or tape it uh, over the top of this. Okay. This form right here, this is also uh, in the middle school and high school packet. This parent and athlete agreement is something the state put in last spring. And it's just stating that you agree, parent and athlete, that uh, by signing this, you're stating that you understand the importance, importance of recognizing 
and responding to the signs, symptoms, and behaviors of a concussion or head injury. All right. Now this form is every time you participate in uh, a youth activity okay, until you're uh, out of high school All right. or above the age of 18. Um, they are trying to get this one-time deal, one time once a year, but that has not been approved yet, so we do need to fill this out every single time uh, you participate in a sport. And the last form is the Aurora Bay Care um, Consent for Athletic Training Services and Emergency Medical Treatment. Uh, this is giving us, the coaches, information uh, in case somebody was to be injured uh, during practice or a game and uh, the coach will know who to contact immediately. And also uh, gives our trainer um, the ability to pass on information to the coaches as well. And uh, Nick might be able to expand on that a little bit in a second. Okay, any questions on the forms so far? That are going to be turned in? Okay. Um, there's a couple of other things I want to touch on here on the website. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand column, uh, there's you got directions to all the non-conference schools. Uh, the conference right here highlighted in purple are the Bay Conference schools. If I were to click on that, you'd be able to uh, find out where all the locations of the Bay Conference schools are. Um, there's a list of non-conference schools that we uh, go up against. Um, Right here, fall athletic season start dates. Uh, you may have seen that already. Um, this is for the 2013, this fall, all the uh, start dates and where they are located. show you is what we use is our school it's the program that we put all of our schedules on game schedules practice schedules and so forth um, again you can go to high school I'm just going to use high school right here click on that then over on the right hand side it says high school events calendar 2012-13 um, we need to change that to 1314 but it's still going to show 1314 it doesn't really matter what the year is on that all right so this tells you what's going on at the school right now if you look on the far right, uh, where it says view schedules, I'm just going to pick out. Uh, all right, I'll go to football. Um, go to football eighth grade. All right, this is the uh, game schedule for the eighth graders coming up this fall. Uh, gives you dates, uh, the time of the game, and what time the bus departure is. And if there's any other added information, it's over on the comments section. Uh, some of the schools for middle school uh, play their games that uh, might not be right at the uh, school location. Uh, so, uh, I think a middle, middle school cross country event might be at Meadowbrook uh, Park in Green Bay, and it'll list that then. So, that's how you find the uh, all the game schedules are right here in this view schedule. And then the last thing I want to show you on here is right here, notify me. Uh, this is kind of a nice little tool. Uh, we don't have many people signed up on it. I'm not sure if everybody's aware of it. But if you click on that, you can get information anytime a, uh, a game or practice or game is changed. Um, you can get a uh, text message or an email, whatever you sign up for. Let's uh, say, for instance, uh, uh, we want to know the uh, boy, basketball boys varsity. Okay, we 
you want to know whenever their games are being played, uh, you can do multiple events. And uh, let's say you want to know when graduation. Uh, there's a senior here. Marcus over there? All right. Marcus isn't sure he's going to get up in time for graduation in spring. All right, so right here, uh, he wants to be sure that uh, he knows when his basketball games are for varsity this coming winter, and he wants to be notified two hours in advance, so he'll get an email or a text. Uh, he wants to be sure he gets up for graduation uh, two hours in advance. All right, so he's all set there. Um, and over on this side, also notify me with all scheduled changes. All right. Besides letting them know when the uh, games are going to be, um, if a uh, boys varsity basketball game gets uh, snowed out, all right, we get a blizzard, he wants to know, um, obviously this could be more useful for the, useful for the parents, um, if there's a change in the schedule, as soon as we make the change on this program, you'll get an email or a text message okay, if you sign up for that. We got them checked off. All right, and then fill in your name, first, last name, your email address. Uh, you can do a second email address. Uh, you create a password. And if you want the cell phone, you can do either one or both. All right, you can do the cell phone, emails. Uh, let's fill in all the information, save the settings, and uh, you'll get notified every time uh, those events come up or there's a change in the schedule. Okay, that's uh, all I got on that. Any questions as far as the schedules, the R school program? Okay, next up is uh, Nick Olson from Aurora Baker. He's going to talk a little bit about the concussions that we do do and uh, athletic republic. Thanks. Um, like I said, my name is Nick Olson. I'm with Aurora Baker Sports Medicine. Um, I'm here uh, to talk to you about concussions, how we manage them. That's probably the most important topic that I'm going to cover today. And also some additional opportunities and services that uh, Aurora Baker Sports Medicine offers through our partnership with the school district uh, for athletes. So we'll kind of get into that. Um, We'll be offering various sports medicine services um, that include, I'll get to in a minute, that uh, really are designed to be, uh, we are really designed to be a resource and a tool to keep your athletes healthy, um, successful, and hopefully, uh, like the second one says, uh, increase performance in any way that we can on, on the field, uh, keep them, like I said, healthy, and make sure that uh, we keep them on the field as much as possible. Okay, Jacobson will be your athletic trainer. Um, she couldn't be here tonight. But uh, she'll be here. She's here five days a week, you know, and beyond. She's, you know, typically, you know, whenever there's an event going on, practice game, she's uh, typically here um, before practice games, after practice games, for any treatments, any preparations, icing, uh, taping, things like that. Um, any issues you guys have uh, with um, injuries, you know, please feel free to see her. Um, make sure they are injuries that we don't want to. Uh, there's a difference between being injured and hurt, so make sure you guys know that difference. Um, but she is a good resource um, for anything related to sports injuries. And Dr. Uh, Michael Schnaubelt is uh, the high school's uh, dedicated uh, school physician. And um, I know he's here for every home football game. He's also a resource, and uh, hopefully it doesn't happen, but uh, if, if an athlete does get injured where they do need to see him or one of his partners at our orthopedic group, um, Kate can uh, really get them in uh, immediately, typically the next day, uh, to see one of those physicians. So I just want to throw that out there for everybody. Um, we really want to, uh, these are the services kind of in a nutshell that we, uh, we offer. Um, kind of went over the first one. But, um, you know, we're really big into preventing um, injuries. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, we want to be able to assess injuries and treat injuries. 
Um, Kate does do a good job of, of all that, and she is available here to do some, you know, rehab with any athletes who have sustained injuries. Um, next is coordinated care. It is important um, for the athlete, the team, the coach, um, parents to make sure that if an athlete does get injured, that we coordinate that care to make sure he or she is seeing who, he, who they need to see as efficiently and as quickly as possible to get any injury-related uh, issue taken care of. Um, we'll offer a couple of uh, presentations throughout the course of the year on uh, some sports-related topics that uh, will really benefit you as parents and you as athletes to know about um, and how to prevent injuries, how to increase performance, sports nutrition. Um, I'm going to do the concussion one today, so there'll be a, things that pop up over the course of the year that uh, I'll work with Mr. Miller on and uh, we'll get uh, the word out to, so hopefully uh, we get some good attendance uh, there. Um, performance sports training opportunities. I know uh, Kate has been out uh, this summer working with the kids in their summer program. So I think that's, uh, that's been going well. Um, and then we have additional opportunities, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, um, at our facility for, for, your, for your athletes. And then uh, managing concussions, how we manage concussions, uh, things like that. So before I jump into the big topic of how we manage concussions, I want to briefly hit on Athletic Republic and what this is. Uh, I'm going to play a quick video. I know uh, it's always nice to visually see what uh, a program like this is. Sorry, it's kind of a commercial, so it's really going to promote the program. So as you can see, it's, it's a program designed to increase an athlete's performance, and um, there's all sports up there. We, we train an athlete who, who plays tennis, swimming, soccer, football, volleyball, any sport, you know, our trainers are very good at adapting to the different sports. So really what we're doing is we're putting an athlete in a position to succeed once they get into their season. Um, big component of it is increasing an athlete's performance. Uh, like I mentioned before, that another, another big component, which I think is probably more um, important is, is preventing injuries. Um, a, a catastrophic injury, we'll use a, an ACL injury for example. Um, you're looking at typically six to nine, even longer month rehab if you sustain that injury. And uh, that hurts, a, that hurt, obviously hurts the, the athlete him or herself. Um, the team loses a person who they would have relied on throughout the course of the season, um, the coach as well. But uh, if we can avoid uh, those injuries by training an athlete properly during the right time, um, that's really what our focus is on. Um, keeping that athlete healthy throughout the course of the year, putting that athlete in a position to withstand the, the demands day in and day out of practice, of games, of multiple seasons going on back to back. You know, that's really what we want to do in training our athletes, is um, putting them in a position to uh, not sustain that catastrophic injury because we know how important it is to everybody that we avoid those injuries. And you can do that. Um, not all injuries are preventable. Um, but we can drastically reduce that risk um, by training an athlete properly with good mechanics, good form, training the muscles properly by strengthening all the areas around the knee, the ankle, the shoulders, those types of things. So that's really what this program is designed to do. And um, as you can see, we incorporate the sport that your athlete is, is, is training for um, into the training. So. But, you know, a big question I receive when talking about this type of program is, well, when do I do this training? And best case scenario, and I know this is rarely the case, but you're going to do this program before your season starts. Um, so, for example, we're about to start the fall sports season. Hopefully a lot of you have taken advantage of the program here at the high school. Um, 
but uh, this summer would have been the time for you to prepare for your fall sport. So if you don't play a fall sport, you play basketball, wrestling, and play in the winter. Coming up, uh, starting in August, is really the time you're going to want to think of uh, that, you know, starting that training program. Um, whether it's uh, with us, which I hope you take advantage of, or the opportunities here at the high school, which are, which I know are great uh, programs as well. Um, but really, everybody's doing it now, and you got to really take advantage of those opportunities to kind of stay, you know, not even ahead of the game, but with everybody else, your com your competition, because everybody's doing this type of training, and it's important, like I said, not only for performance but preventing those injuries. So there's my uh, spiel on Athletic Republic and uh, how we train athletes. And if you have any questions, um, feel, please feel free to ask. I'll uh, stick around after as well. Um, but concussions, um, as uh, Mr. Miller said, uh, the state adopted that concussion law, and um, we feel we feel and we're, we're, we feel it's a good thing because it really takes the decision making out of those who don't um, aren't trained in managing concussions. So we're really excited about this. Um, this is the definition of a concussion. You know, there are a lot of uh, um, misconceptions of what a concussion is, but it's, a, it's, it's an injury to your brain, essentially. You know, people think of an injury to your, your, your ankle, your knee, your shoulder, your hand, whatever. Think of a, a concussion as that type of injury because it really is an injury. Um, there's really no universally accepted definition. There's always ongoing research on uh, how we manage concussions, how we identify concussions, but uh, it is, uh, it is a tough injury to, uh, to, to identify. Um, here are a couple of facts. Um, athletes who sustain concussions and have another one and have another one, they are more susceptible um, to increasing an increased risk of a, an, an ongoing, uh, or another concussion, I should say. Um, every concussion, you know, time-wise is different. Every kid is different. Um, the, you know, so it's, there's no, you're back, you'll be back in a week. There's really no way we can tell that it's a day-by-day -day process and how each kid is reacting to the symptoms, to their surroundings, and to activity. And then uh, the last one, and most people think this, if I didn't lose uh, consciousness so I didn't have a concussion, that's absolutely not true because as you can see at that statistic, only 90% of, uh, or 90 of concussions do not result in loss of consciousness. So these are the things our trainers are looking for, our staff are looking for when, uh, when I'm trying to identify a concussion. They do have additional tools um, that they use. Um, they have an assessment form that they use or assessment tool that they use on the sideline. But in you as parents too, um, if you see your, your son or daughter having these type of symptoms, um, chances are you know, they could have a concussion, especially if you notice you know, a big hit or a, an, an episode where they could have jolted their head, hit the head on the ground against another player, you know, so on and so forth. And these are what your son or daughter might tell you um, if, if, if they have a concussion. Um, they're really sensitive to light and noise. Um, they just, you can tell they're not right. You can tell they're not being themselves. Um, number one uh, symptom is going to be a headache. And, uh, Severity of headaches are, you know, very based on, on the athlete. Um, but these are things that you can look at. Um, and, and they can be delayed. You know, an athlete can suffer a concussion during a game. Symptoms may not arise for another couple of hours. So, you know, if you notice, for example, you know, your son or daughter going out for a header in a soccer game and they collide with another athlete, um, maybe just kind of keep, uh, keep tabs on them. Make sure that the, they're, they're, they're okay even four, five, six, seven, eight hours after the, after the game. And this is what we want to avoid. Obviously, we want to avoid concussions, you know, the first one. But uh, second, impact sin second impact syndrome uh, can be catastrophic. Um, essentially, it's sustaining a second concussion before the first concussion healed completely. And uh, there are some, and that's why these laws are coming into play over the, over the you know, entire nation, um, that people don't know or haven't identified kids with a concussion they develop this second impact syndrome. Like I said, it can be catastrophic. It can be, you know, it's going to be, uh, it can be fatal. So we want to make sure we avoid that. And that's why the, the, the management of the, of the concussion, which I'm going to go over in a couple of minutes, is so important. Um, so the bill, the actual state law that was adopted, um, any kid identified as having any symptoms related to a concussion needs to be immediately removed from play. 
they need to be evaluated by a healthcare provider. And in hopefully all cases, uh, that would be Kate um, or one of our athletic trainers. Um, and then on the flip end, after they go through the return to play process, an athlete must be, ha must be cleared by a healthcare provider as well. So a coach, um, an administrator, so on and so forth, uh, is not, are not able to uh, release a kid after a concussion has been sustained. It has to be someone who is a healthcare professional practicing within the scope of their license in the state of Wisconsin. Thank God. You kind of know you kind of run over that, but just make sure everybody signs that form. Uh, if your if your son or daughter does sustain a concussion, um, our our trainers, our staff really have very limited amount of time with them. You know, they're maybe seeing them every day for you know half hour, or whatever hour. Um, they may be in our clinic with a, with a therapist or a doc um, with them for you know, half hour. You guys, as parents. And uh, teammates, you know, especially, um, you're with them the most, most uh, out of the day, and, and teachers as well. Um, but at home, make sure you're at, your son or daughter's getting plenty of rest, you know. Um, minimize their mental stimulation. All this stuff that I'll get into in a second, but, you know, TV, texting, all that sort of stuff. Gotta stay hydrated, eat healthy, good foods. Um, limit their social uh, situations, and, um, They'll, they'll receive some accommodations in school. You know? um, any mental stimulation is going to delay that uh, healing process. I know you're going to look at the, this list of activities and say, yeah, right, like I'm going to keep my son or daughter from doing all these type of things. Um, I know it's, it's, it's going to be tough, but think of it this way. If you're doing these things, you're, you're delaying that recovery process. So if you uh, have a knee injury, you're going to go out and run two miles on it. Probably not, because you're going to hurt more. Like I said, uh, a concussion is a brain injury, so doing these things, you're stimulating your brain, and it's not allowing it to heal because of that stimulation. So trying to, you know, if you can't cut them out altogether, um, avoid them or minimize them as much as possible because that'll only increase your healing process and get, get you back to school um, full functioning and as well as physical activity. That's probably the biggest thing, uh, you know, one of the biggest thing our athletic trainers um, say is those type of things that these kids are just not, they're still doing those things, and it's just kind of delaying that whole process. So um, these, are some, these are some things that uh, we've worked with the administrators here at the school um, and, and the teachers on recommending some accommodations um, with an athlete who has a concussion. Um, these types of things with testing, homework, uh, computer, you know, screens and things like that, um, loud classes should be said those accommodations should be given to that student so they can um, get back uh, to full functioning as quickly as possible. Um, we want to make sure that you're keeping up on track with your, your classes because that's very important. So um, all these things are done, but make sure you're keeping up with all your schoolwork. And the last part is probably the most important part because um, it's not, it's, it's temporary. It's, it's only until your, your healing process is completed or has graduated that you can, those accommodations reduce and eventually um, get back to no accommodations because you're able to participate as a full student. Um, so this is now getting kind of shifting gears from school to play. You're immediately removed from play, you're evaluated. You will not return um, to that current game if a concussion is suspected. If for some reason that you're evaluated by an athletic trainer and they uh, deem that you do not have a concussion, they'll let you go back into play. Um, so you gotta make sure you get evaluated. And then um, our trainer will follow up with you, you know, day after day so you can kind of graduate that process of getting back to play. Um, I have uh, this, I have a bunch of copies here. This is our return to play protocol. Um, as you can see, it's kind of a stepwise process. Um, you're basically going from injury, um, removal from play, sideline assessment, um, then you're into, a re we're reassessing you within 24 hours. We say go home, rest, do nothing for 24 hours. Very symptomatic. Then we'll do, what, you know, we'll do a follow-up impact test, which is the, the concussion assessment uh, tool that we use as a cognitive tool. We pass that. Then you want a physical activity. And there's, 15 minutes of uh, light activity, no symptoms, you go on to the next one, which is uh, 30 minutes of a sports-specific uh, test. 
past that, you know, and this is passing being asymptomatic, your symptoms don't come back after you do this physical uh, exertion. And you keep going and going and going until you get to full practice without any limitations, and then you're good to go. But any reemergence of symptoms along that process, we're going to kind of take a step back, give you time to rest, and kind of work your way back through that process. And then obviously just a couple of things on hopefully preventing some concussions. Um, here, rules, proper form, good sportsmanship, uh, things like that. So make sure that you wear your equipment as it's appropriately used and uh, should hopefully prevent some, uh, some concussions. So anytime you have any questions about uh, the presentation, about concussions in general, um, Kate's gonna be your main, your main source. Uh, she's going to be your first point of contact. She can answer a lot of your questions and if she can't answer the questions she's going to find a medical professional who can answer your questions because we have a great staff of, uh, of, of physicians and, and professionals uh, that, that really specialize in managing concussions. Uh, any sort, sort of concussion. We don't even classify concussions as mild, severe, moderate, things like that. Any concussion has a significant impact um, and uh, can um, have an effect uh, long term. Like I said, concussions do have cumulative effects where you know, congr you know it takes longer to recover and it's easier to you know attain a concussion. And then uh, young athletes, the younger you are, typically the longer it takes for you to recover from a concussion because your brain is still uh, still growing, still uh, developing. So just be aware that if you have you know young young athletes. High school athletes, you know, all of them take longer to feel than a professional football player or hockey player. Um, I'll just kind of wrap up uh, upcoming opportunities. Um, all year long, if, if you, you started out or you as an athlete, you want to train and do our Athletic Republic program, um, any pricing that you receive, if you call in and get pricing or whatever, um, since we have a partnership with, with the school districts, we're going to offer you 15% discount on all programming. So I uh, wanted to make you aware of that. Um, Pro, you know, the training is Monday through Friday during the school year, um, 4 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., and we have uh, Saturday morning hours as well. Um, we do individual training, we do small group, a couple, you know, two or three, or we do team training. So all that sort of stuff we can do uh, at our facility. Um, and I uh, just wanted to make you aware that uh, best time to train, like I said, is before your season starts. So please take advantage of that. We're there to help. We're there to make you a better athlete, and hopefully uh, make a... Uh, Denmark Athletics um, uh, better as well with, uh, with training athletes here at, at the school. And like uh, Mr. Miller mentioned, um, sports physicals. Everyone needs a sports physical. Um, these are the dates we're, we're hosting them. Uh, um, July, excuse me, uh, typing here. Um, July so it starts tomorrow, it's Thursday, then um, in, on the 5th and the 7th. Um, what's nice about our physical, it's very comprehensive, uh, things that a lot of parents like is we do a cardiomyopathy screening of the heart, it's an echocardiogram. It's a, it's a test that we take about eight to nine screens of, a, of an athlete's heart, and uh, it's amazing. Um, we have found a, a decent amount of abnormalities that you may or may not know of, um, and we wanna, you know, the idea is to avoid any you know, sudden cardiac arrest on, on, on the practice for their game field. So these are great, it's free, um, it's part of the physical. We'll take uh, every kid through it, um, you'll be you'll be notified uh, with a letter um, one way or the other on how the test came out. So I think it's a very good tool. It's a good peace of mind for you as a parent uh, to receive that for your son or daughter. Um, so call. Um, there are flyers out here um, in that table that um, has a number, has everything that we do, and uh, has the dates on it as well. I do also have uh, Athletic Republic information on that table as well, along with a free trial session card. So if you don't know you, this program is for you, just call us, set up a time to come in and do a free session and uh, talk to our trainers and, and encourage the parents to come in with you. And uh, we'll see, make sure it's right to fit for you as an athlete. Thank you very much, Dave. All right, I'm going to say just to uh, get out of here, so I'll make this real brief. Uh, the packets, high school packets are back out on the table if you need to pick one of those up. Also, um, one last reminder, you must 
get the forms and fees in the Friday prior to the start of the season. All right? um, just, for example, middle school volleyball starts on the Tuesday, the first day of school. We have Labor Day on that Monday. So middle school volleyball players, you must get it in on that Friday, Friday prior to Labor Day okay, to be eligible to practice on that Tuesday um, when you get to uh, school that day. Uh, all right, hopefully everything here is uh, beneficial to you uh, as we uh, start the new uh, school season. Um, we have a nice uh, uh, start to the fall, the athletics, and continue it on through the winter and spring. Uh, last thing on the agenda, you'll see the uh, pricing for athletic passes. If you're interested in purchasing those, uh, stop in and see Barb or Christy at the front desk for uh, passes. Anybody have any questions? I'll uh, be sticking around if you want to come down and see me. Uh, as well. So thanks a lot for coming and we'll see you at the ball games.